everybody, and welcome to HardAssetsInvestor.com. I'm Mike Norman, your host. Today, my guest is Sean Heyman. He's the editor of the Ultimate Wealth Report. Sean, thanks very much for coming back on the show. Really appreciate it. Good um, to be with you. Thank you. Now, uh, recently, you've been talking a lot about oil, and I want to start off with that. I want to get your uh, view, your outlook on the oil market right now, uh, particularly in light of... You know, we had a run-up in prices. We're seeing a little bit of a pullback, um, and some other things on the horizon having to do with uh, politics and the political situation potentially very negative for the economy. Uh, what do you see? You know, short-term, medium-term for oil. Yeah, oil is a bit of a blessing and a curse. Uh, I love it near term, and, and I'll, I'll love it for a while. I think it's got further to go. Um, the reasons why I think so mainly are because I see a recovery happening in China. Uh, they're still growing at 7.5%, 7.7% uh, GDP growth. So that's still very robust. Uh, a lot of places around the world are growing at half percent, one percent, one and a half percent. So it's still a growth engine of the world. Um, you're starting to see a, a huge recovery in, uh, or at least a, a respectable recovery, we'll say it, in, in Europe. So so those two combined are two big powerhouses recovering at the same time, which I keep, which I believe is is keeping a bid under oil and keeping it well supported. Um, WTI, you know, stubbornly wants to stay above one hundred dollars a barrel, um, even with us producing more oil here and things of that sort. And I think a lot of those are the, are the factors that are contributing to that. And I think so. In the near term, we could see oil rise to one ten, one twelve. Um, ultimately, it could go higher if the global economy sustains itself. The problem is that oil eventually gets to a point where it becomes an ankle weight on the economy. Right. That's the curse side of it. So uh, once it gets up to about historically about 115 to 130s or so uh, and sustains that for any good length of time, that's when it starts to begin to act as an ankle weight and starts grinding uh, the, the world a bit slower. Uh, and that's where it becomes a curse. And, and then it'll eventually take oil shoes down. Cement shoes at 130 be yes. like cement shoes. Yes. Now here, here's a, a, an interesting, uh, and I think you, you kind of alluded to it. You know, we're, we're still up at these levels which are historically high yet you see things like uh, record amounts of oil production out of the United States in fact the US has once again taken the number one global producer spot away from Russia so lots of new supply uh, coming you have uh, it's still slow growth in the United States and Europe despite a, a very tepid mm -hmm. recovery China has come down and then sort of the, the, the fading away of some of these geopolitical factors right as, as Syria we're not talking about that anymore okay Iran President Obama w met with the Iranian or, or spoke to him so there's mm -hmm. a little bit of a of a detente or whatever going on there um, and in spite of all that things that I guess you would normally consider bearish oil prices have hung in there right mm-hmm they really have. And, I mean, you know, you, you do still have Libya still trying to get some of their oil production back up a bit. You do still have some concerns in Egypt just because they really don't have a real government right now. Not really a lot of stability right there. So there's still some concerns. But you're right. The biggest parts of the concerns are, are down. So it's taken some of the, the fear premium out of the price of oil. Yet it certainly remains above $100 a barrel. It does. It is, and, yeah. and, and even with all this supply coming on uh, that we're seeing from, you know, uh, Bakken, and Eagleford. But, but, but there's a lot of that that has spiked up. And, and the charts that I'm seeing showing their barrels per day, you know, keep uh, decreasing. So it's 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 almost like they, it, you know, if these charts are accurate, that they peaked early and and they're still producing well, but but continue to produce less and less. So so if that's the case, then you know we could still see oil hold well above 100 for quite some time. All right. So we're looking at fairly stable prices, in your opinion, uh, trending slightly higher. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's move to some of the metals markets. Uh, gold, for example. Uh, how do you view gold right now? I th you know, the sentiment is still horrible on gold. Uh, but I think that gold has, has found a bottom in July. Uh, it's rallied up, and, and now we're seeing the next leg down. I believe that we will likely see a higher low there, and so if so, that will be bullish for gold. Um, I, and, and a lot of that is because, you know, the dollar keeps uh, sinking. The dollar broke a two-year uptrend line recently. It's been falling since July, so that, of course, is helping. Obviously, the government shutdown that we're seeing and, and debt ceiling debates and things of that sort can uh, help gold, at least near term. Uh, because tend to, the tendency is as debt ceilings are raised, gold tends to uh, to, to ratchet up uh, uh, overall as well. Obviously not in, just in tandem, but overall it does. Um, so I think that gold could go anywhere from... Um, 
to the to the fifteen to sixteen hundreds over the up, you know over the upcoming months. Um, would that would that would that also be the case? Let's say in a very bad economic downturn. Let, let's say these uh, uh, the the debt ceiling issue and everything else um, unfolds into a, a, or creates a deep recession. Would that be negative for gold or positive in your view? I think it would be positive. So I, I think we go to you know fifteen, sixteen hundred eventually at, at, at any stretch. But if things get overly bearish, uh, if the markets start tumbling too much, if the economy slows down too much, things of this sort, I personally think that that's going to jack gold up even faster, and it would get there much more quickly, and and could possibly you know even go back old, up to its old highs if that were the case. Really, but you don't see a, any sort of a liquidation event coming into play as people maybe scramble for liquidity. They they will initially. I mean, anytime you, you have an initial downturn, gold usually does take a hit because it's so liquid. People can sell it off many, many times at a profit from where they've held it you know, a long time back ago because a lot of gold holders have been fairly long-term investors. So, so a lot of liquidity can be had there to cover things like margin calls or you know, any kind of shortcomings to shore up their accounts. So some of that does happen initially, but over time, you know, gold tends to do quite well in those conditions. And you talked a little bit about uh, China rebounding somewhat, maybe having put in a bottom economically. Uh, what does that portend for some of the industrial metals, copper, for example, which closely linked to uh, the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. Ch China being the largest uh, consumer of copper. Is that bullish for copper? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, the the thing about copper, of course, there has been an oversupply that's that's been needing to get weeded down for quite some time. Still possibly a little bit of it out there. But now that you're starting to see an upturn in China, uh, again, a, at least a mild upturn in Europe, um, that's going to help uh, spur more demand upon copper and will help deplete those supplies. So I think that you know, traders have taken that into account already uh, in, in previous months and have really priced that into the price of copper. So I believe that copper can go higher from here. You know, I think we can see it go from, you know, the, the, the threes on up to possibly close to four or a little better over time. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish on copper. Freeport McMoran is a, is a stock that I like, mm -hmm. um, you know, copper stock, and I think it could go quite a bit higher as well. Yeah, that's that's pulled back quite a bit from its highs. Absolutely. Now, I know you're a, you, you know, your framework that you use is, is the value approach, and I know you also apply that to specific regions and countries. Is there any particular region or country that stands out? What about Brazil, for example? Now, Brazil was a hot area. It was a hot country, very much tied into the commodity boom. We've seen problems there or weakness there. Mm -hmm. um, w would you go in as a contrarian now? Um, I would as long as I have a long enough time horizon. So I think if somebody has a 12 or 18 month time horizon, I think they can go into Brazil and certain other emerging markets right now, or they can go into a, a BRICS type of ETF if they want a little broader expo exposure. But I think uh, Brazil looks good. I think Turkey looks good. Uh, so those are some places that I think are, they will experience some bumps in the road. They will be volatile. You need to have a, a strong stomach in the near term uh, because you will experience a lot of ups and down turmoil. But overall, I think over the next 12 to 18 months, they have a good outlook. Well, that's not that long. You're talking about a right. year, year and a half. Yes, that's, absolutely. So that's not like a long, long term. Yes. Okay, that looks good. Well, we're going to definitely be following those things, and Sean, it's always great having you on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's it for now, folks. This is Mike Norman saying see you next time. Bye-bye.